Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are so glad you are all able to join us today. As we get started today, just a reminder to everyone to um, please uh, keep yourself muted during today's presentation. And um, you can also turn off your camera if you're not um, speaking during the presentation. My name is Erin Patel. I'm the co-chair of the Workshop Planning Committee who designed today's first session of the workshop series on exploring the role of health professional students and trainees as members of the health workforce. This workshop is an activity of the Global Forum on Innovation and in Health Professional Education. I wanna thank the members of both the forum for selecting this important topic and also the members of the planning committee for helping us think through the critical issues which affect the role of learners, both during times of crises, like we saw at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic as well as during times of non-crises. I'm gonna turn it over now to my co-chair, Robert Kane, to describe some of the thinking that went into the design of today's session. Bob, over to you. Bob, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, I was disconnected just as I started to speak, so I apologize for that. So as Aaron mentioned, today's session builds on ideas discussed by the planning committee, which look to consider decision points along a continuum that help leaders think through the ramifications of going down a particular path. What are the risks and benefits? What questions need to be considered who needs to be consulted? How will each stakeholder be affected? This is what we are calling a decision tree. As part of the decision tree, today's speakers have been asked to share with us their recent experiences in how decisions were made to remove learners from in-person experiential learning at the start of the pandemic. We will first hear from Allison Whelan, who will describe the process AAMC went through. Then we will hear from Julie Kornfeld at Columbia University, who will outline the thought process and steps they went through with the public health programs there. And third, we will hear from Keisha Kelly at Legacy Health, who will help explain how the decision was made in Portland, Oregon to pull nursing students from clinical rotations. After we hear from each of the speakers, we will send you into one of six breakout groups where a workshop planning committee member will facilitate a discussion that leads the group to a question or comment for the speakers. After 30 minutes in your small groups, we will bring you back into the main room so the planning committee members can state their group's question or comment. So now I think it's time for us to get started. I will ask Allison Whelan, Chief Medical Education Officer, Association of American Medical Colleges, to unmute her mic and share her screen if she has slides. While she does that, please refer to the speaker's bios that are in your accompanying documents. Allison. Thank you so much, uh, Bob and Erin um, and everyone on the planning committee. It's a pleasure to be here and to see a bunch of familiar names, although I didn't see most of your faces. Um, just as we get started, can you see my slides appropriately? Are you seeing a title slide? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to tell you this uh, briefly, um, the story of um, Association of American Medical Colleges um, decision regarding um, pulling students from uh, direct patient contact during COVID. Um, and just to remind you all, the AMC is a member organization of all 155 and growing um, MD accredited um, schools, as well as um, over 400 major teaching hospitals and some academic societies, but really focusing on um, the medical school um, work that we did. So just remember that number that we are a member organization. Um, we're a nonprofit, we have a board. Um, our board is less than 30 people and represents a couple of deans as students, as trainees, as members of the teaching hospital, but certainly not every person um, from, uh, not a person from every medical school that we represent. 
Um, so I wanted to start um, with um, this forward. Am I in slideshow mode for you all? So, you are not. I'm not. Okay, that looks like slideshow mode now, yes? There you go, yep. Thank yes. you. Um, so starting um, where we always try to start with, with um, anything we talk about with physicians is thinking about professionalism um, and going back to the physician charter on professionalism in 2002, because it certainly drove uh, much of the thinking that we did really about um, whether you're talking about patient care or learning, um, the concept of um, the primacy of patient welfare, patient autonomy, and social justice. Um, and we put that in terms of thinking about priorities of learners in the clinical setting. Um, public and population safety are sort of the baseline, student and learning, and student safety um, at the core of things. And always at the top is patient care and patient safety. Before COVID, most of us in medical school, as we thought about learning, when we thought about potential conflicts or ethical areas or, or value judgments, it had to do with individual students and individual patient care and the patient safety, supervision level, autonomy, et cetera. Um, and really, um, COVID changed that for us. The other important thing to think about is the level of student risk um, in patient care. Um, and we always assume that there is, for all health professions trainees, um, an expectation to undertake some level of risk. Um, it's balanced by the level of risk, the skill of the learner, the responsibility of the team and patient, um, and you know, just to have some of the typical things we might think about. Um, and influenza was one um, which was routine um, and considered low risk, um, both in terms of um, difficulty and, and long-term risk for students and assume the availability of PPE. And wanna put this in the context as we think about how COVID was different. So how was COVID different? Um, first of all, it was a new disease. We didn't understand things back in, in March of 2020. Um, knew there was high transmissibility, knew there was an asymptomatic contagious phase, um, didn't know the exact numbers, but morbidity and, and mortality were high. Um, and many places in the country had reached community level spread, although some were poised and had very few cases um, at the time that we were beginning our discussions. And critically important, there was insufficient PPE and unavailable testing. Um, so how did we make our decision making? Um, I think going back to this slide, it really shifted things in a way that none of us had thought about before that um, patient care and safety at the individual level remained important, but really thinking about student involvement um, as impacting public health and population safety, which really ended up driving um, our decision making in March of 2020 with the idea of really flattening the curve. Um, so I had never been through a pandemic before, um, neither had anyone else at the AMC at any of our schools. And it was a time of uncertainty because the uh, our understanding of the uh, virus was changing. Um, our availability of testing was not there, but there was hope that it would be. And so really think about, you know, what, how do we do our decision-making in a time of uncertainty? One of the critical things um, for everyone and for us, and I'll talk about it, was what is our decision-making role in this? We are a member organization, um, not an accreditor, um, and I explained how our governance works. Um, identify what the data gaps are so we can be as informed as possible and really be aware of what the ethical values and principles are and where the potential conflicts are so that we could really weigh those benefits. Um, and then we focused on utilizing what our mission is, what our values are, what data was available. And importantly, um, because it was an evolving process, um, developed on the fly, this was not, we are going to do this, but as we worked through the process, it became very routine a rapid cycle core team um, to develop the work, and then a set of trusted reviewers. We did not go to every 155 of our schools and say, hey, what do you think of this? But we did have trusted reviewers across the continuum um, to help us with our decision-making. So what was our unique role is that, you know, we had in March of 2020, a unique national perspective. We were talking to people all across the country, um, both educators and clinicians in terms of what they were seeing from New York um, which was inundated to Missouri that was like, yeah, I haven't seen much yet. Um, and um, in direct contact with federal agencies really giving us their perspective and sort of looking around the corner side of things and looking to us for um, 
connection with the academic health centers as well. And our mission is to lead and serve academic medicine and really struggled with that in terms of what was the role of leading versus serving here. Um, and um, then recognized that um, there's huge variability at the local level. Schools missions were different, how they worked within their community, the level of COVID um, spread within the community, um, the availability of PPE, which initially was variable and then became relatively tight everywhere. And really importantly, and this evolved more over time um, in our second and third roles of decision-making, state and local rules differed and we needed to not um, recommend things that would be in violation of what um, schools need to do within their, their local context. So coming back to this, um, again, thinking about um, how we made our decisions. Um, this, the things at the bottom are the areas that we always do. And we found that we took these and pivoted them um, and used them in COVID as well. Um, so created the guidelines and recommendations for our members, which I'll talk about specifically for this. But then we did a lot of collecting and, and disseminating resources. We collected data on what our schools were doing. Um, when we... Uh, suggested that students be taken away from clinical rotations. Then we collected and disseminated resources on alternative educational things, which was a huge boon. Um, convene members and, cons and constituents. We do it on an annual basis, we do it on a quarterly basis um, during COVID um, across all of our different member groups from student affairs people to medical education leaders to deans. We're convening them on a weekly basis both so they could talk among themselves and to help inform us so that as we continue to make guidelines, it was informed by our members. And then of course, provide public statements, which we've continued to do throughout the pandemic. So that was what we did. Um, and um, I just wanna focus on this specifically. So to the March of 2020, um, we did come out with a guideline um, related to student involvement in direct patient contact. Um, it was three pages long. Um, and the important thing is that um, this guideline and every other guideline said, this is a guideline, it is a recommendation that every school though remains autonomous and needs to do what fits with their mission, with their local situation and with their local laws. And we really meant that and that was important to the deans and it really reflects our role as a member organization. And so we said, we strongly suggest that medical students not be involved in any direct patient care activities. And the critical reasons which initially many people were saying, oh, you know, you don't understand students need to be involved in patient care. You're protecting them too much. Yes, we care about patient safety, but the driver for us was bending the curve for the public health of the community and maintaining um, public and healthcare worker safety because we couldn't know who was infected. Um, they could be part of the community spread. We didn't have testing, we didn't have sufficient PPE. And that was really important for people to understand that, that that's where we were. This continued in March, um, and as I said, um, we did a lot of work helping our members um, continue the student um, education um, through alternative ways. Um, and then um, had a second uh, recommendation in August 2020, um, which built on the first, um, which was the idea that although an individual student um, is not an essential healthcare worker on any given day, that the medical student um, is the essential and emerging physician workforce. Um, and that therefore the clinical education of our medical students um, in, in, is critical and that that needs to continue. And this was driven again from our conversations um, with our members, particularly our educators and deans, that as um, hospitals were opening back up, as we we're beginning to have testing and more PPE, that there was some reluctance for, to bring students back into the clinic or for hospitals to provide PPE for the students. Um, and so this was specifically saying, you know, we need to do this and for our academic health centers, it's just critical for your future workforce. If we go graduate students this spring, you won't have interns in July and then the following year as well. Um, so we continued to evolve um, our work and really continued to use the same um, concept of thinking about um, what is our role, what are the gaps, um, and then utilizing both our mission values and data, um, and really use this rapid cycle core team with trust reviewers. Um, a relatively small subset, not always the same people, um, that we could trust to say, you know what, you're missing the boat here in terms of this language or whatever. But ultimately we did take responsibility um, and that they were guidelines and recommendations. And I'm just gonna take one minute and talk about um, so that was the, that was the 
official sort of way we did it unofficial. Um, it evolved over time. We had had um, a rapid response team over all of the organization that we've used before to support our schools in particular when there've been um, natural disasters. We utilize that for sharing within the organization. Um, but when it came to doing these guidelines and other things, um, I was directly involved with it. Um, and it is the other part that you need to know, um, and I know that all of you uh, uh, can identify with this as well, is that the part that doesn't show up were the informal conversations that we had. Um, I would call people um, at five in the morning, at 11 o'clock at night, and say, what are we doing here? This is what I've just heard. Um, and countless lost um, nights of sleep um, wondering if we are doing the right thing. And I think that um, we always felt the best, despite the incredible difficulty of this, when we all went back and said, what are our mission? What is the, our values? What is the current data? How can we serve and how can we lead? And really had people that we had a deep trusting relationship with because it's probably the most difficult work we've, we've done. Um, so I will stop there and turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate uh, you sharing the thought process that went into the decision making with uh, AAMC. Um, next, I would like to introduce Julie Kornfeld, the vice president, uh, vice provost, sorry, for academic programs at Columbia University. Julie, thank you, Bob. Let me see if I can share my screen and turn myself into okay. Great, um, thank you. I'm happy to be here and I'm gonna share a little bit of perspective into more from a Columbia's perspective um, and, and how we made decisions around um, our public health learners on campus um, and walk through a little bit of that. Um, and some I think maybe the unique factors that, that are situated around public health professionals. Um, I think there were a couple things that went into our decision-making that I just wanted to sort of to lay out, which is, um, public health students play a critical role in interprofessional health teams, but a somewhat unique one um, in that they're not engaged directly in clinical care. Um, but yet most public health schools are, are physically located on the campus with other health professional schools. So we were you know, in, on a setting where we have physicians in training, nurses in training, dentists in training. Um, and so our public health students were in that mix um, at a time, I think that Allison just really um, outlined very critically, and we were here in New York City, which you know early on was the epicenter of the epidemic. And, and one of the considerations was, you know, what role do we do we need our public health students on campus when we have multiple healthcare professions in training and healthcare workers on the same campus? Um, the other thing is, I think you know we both um, in public health have students engaged in both didactic and experiential learning. While they're not in clinical settings, um, part of their required training is to be in the field, um, embedded in community-based organizations, completing capstone and field experience projects. Um, I think the other thing is that we had um, public health students, like most health professionals, are, are um, very much called to service, and, and um, we jokingly say in public health that often. Um, uh, students in public health tend to run towards an emergency. We have students that work in areas like forced migration and other kinds of areas and Ebola. And so public health workers are often trained to run towards an emergency. And here, given the, the uncertainty and um, the, the situation, um, situational proximity we were to the healthcare center, the fact that New York City was really an early epicenter, um, all of that I think came into play um, as we were trying to make decisions. Uh, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Um, I think the other thing was just, you know, who were the key players um, as we were trying to make decisions about what to do with our students? Um, clearly, there was the university leadership decision. So at the university level, um, we were evaluating um, what, what, what are the best decisions for our learners at a time, again, in, in a time of great uncertainty, um, at a time where we have 17 schools with a lot of different kinds of learners. Um, what's, the, what's the guidance that we're getting at the university level and how does that apply to our own public health students? 
Um, and again, we had that we were, as I mentioned, on the medical campus and multiple scenarios there. We share classrooms, um, we share uh, facilities, we share uh, lots of uh, tra traffic control, et cetera, on the medical campuses is, is all blended in many cases. Um, and so that also played a role in that we, you know, at a time again that Allison alluded to when we were very concerned about safety and community spread, um, you know, do we want to bring learners, more learners on campus when we're really trying to keep our health care workers very safe. Um, we also have accrediting agency, as, as everybody does, um, the Council on Education and Public Health, and what, what, were, what was their guidance and how does that align or not align with what the university and our medical campus decision making process. And then here in New York, we had some, we have a, a, a New York state, um, we have a very tight regulatory agency here that um, approves um, the, our, our methodology for delivering programs. So we don't have permission to actually rem go to remote learning unless the state grants, grants it to us. Um, and so that was also another layer here that we had to consider. Um, and then, you know, obviously we had, you know, we're consulting with our risk management offices and our legal teams in terms of what is safe and feasible um, for our students so that they can continue to progress as learners um, and again, in a, in a time of, of uncertainty. I want to talk, I think, because it's unique to public health and um, in preparing for this, it was suggested I focus a bit more on this. And, you know, one of the unique aspects of, of the public health training, and I'm primarily talking about our master's in public health degree, which is the cornerstone degree in most schools of public health, though we certainly have learners and PhD programs that were in labs and there were other things to um, consider. But I think one of the big areas that we have to talk about was we have this required experience. So students are embedded in global community-based organizations throughout the world, um, and it's a mandatory part of their training. And in March and April of 2020, we, we had most of our students had just finalize their, their summer experience, which is required for them between years one and two. Um, and we had plane reservations to do. And many of our global students had actually um, are required to be um, either three to six months in a global setting as part of their um, graduation requirements. Um, and then all of our students are required, whether it was in New York City or somewhere else um, domestically, to be inside an organization. And our accreditors have very specific guidelines as to what constitutes a field experience. So um, what does it mean what, what, to be embedded in an organization? How many, how, how, um, how the community preceptor, so somebody has to be identified in that community-based organization to lead the students. Um, they have to agree on the scope of work, their learning objectives. There's a tremendous amount of work and all of that had just been put in place and finalized for the summer. Um, and, and where we ended up and, and continued to be through 2021 was we were fully remote. In 2020, certainly all of our field experiences were fully remote. Um, with, and in 2021, it actually that remained the case with, some few, with few exceptions. Um, and, and we did have guidance from um, our accreditors to provide maximum flexibility. So that was good. We were able to use creative solutions and we were told to do so and to do everything possible to ensure that students would could pro progress academically towards this required experience. Um, so I, I think you can imagine there were many challenges and opportunities in doing that. Um, one at, at, at the Mailman School, but again, I think this was this was universal across all schools and programs of public health. And many of us, through the associations of schools and programs in public health, were discussing these daily um, and trying to come up with what what makes sense so that we can ensure that the students not only move forward but do so in a meaningful way that actually um, really um, complements their learning and fulfills our requirements of competencies. Um, in, in their competency-based education in public health. Um, and these were some of the challenges and opportunities. We had, um, you know, many, many of our practice sites, you can imagine, or were public health students and our public health agencies were, were completely overwhelmed. Um, for some, they welcomed learners and said, we need all hands on deck, great, we'll work with you, we'll be flexible, we can, we can work together to accommodate this in, in a way that complements the student's training, but also helps us achieve some emergency needs. Um, but others were like, we just don't have the capacity to, to accommodate the students remotely. Um, so we had to, you know, in many cases, review and consider students on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and this was, you know, incredibly resource intensive. Um, at the Mailman School, we have um, about 500 MPH students um, all in the field at the same time. Um, so trying to go through and look at each of these case by case and say, what's going on here? What do we need to do? Do we need to identify in a replacement site? Do, could that person be 
working with the same partner? Could that student, that learner be in that same organization, but do we have to totally revamp what it was that they were trying to do because the activity um, implementing a community-based service and going door to survey and going door to door is no longer feasible. Is there something else they can do? What's their end product going to look like? What are they going to turn in um, so that we can actually um, determine is this replacement, replacement experience sufficient in, in ensuring that they're achieving the competencies um, and the learning uh, assess uh, learning objectives that we had outlined for them. So you can imagine there's a tremendous amount of work. We turn to faculty, um, help us do outreach to contacts in the community, organizations you're working with. We turn to the students and said, you know, perhaps you had a, a position with an organization, Planned Parenthood, before you came to the school. Can you re-engage with them in a way that might um, actually complement your learning? Um, and we. Um, we allowed students, and this was a, a, a something that CIF had been pre previously pretty strict on, in that if we had students that were working while also pursuing their education, um, they were typically not allowed to do their field experience in their workplace. But we were able to, to actually be creative there and, and expand that as a possibility. Um, so I, I, I think just to give you an idea, I think there, there, that those are some of the, the, the key um, decisions that we had to make is in terms of how do we organize ourselves in, a, in such a way to be able to pivot to remote learning? What are the, who are the key players at the university level, at the state level, at the accrediting agency level, and then within the school, who do we need to engage to be able to do that? Um, I think that what we, we walked away with in, in many ways is that we could, could establish meaningful experiences in a remote format, which, you know, I think for all of us, if we had known, you know, somebody told us this three years ago that a student could be remotely embedded in an organization and have um, a, a very meaningful um, and, and uh, advantageous academic experience, we may not have believed them. Um, we were really required to innovate as everybody was. Um, and I think um, that flexibility allowed some of the organizations um, to tap into students um, as, as resources for them in the midst of this pandemic in a meaningful way that was both advancing the training of the student, but also advancing the work of the organization. Um, I think it also allowed us to say, is this some, and think about as decision points for um, future crises, but also, you know, as we emerge better and stronger, are, are there things we learned here? Are, is there criteria for remote experiences that could resent, represent important opportunities as we move forward? Um, and what's the right decision-making rubric for um, that we learn from this crisis that could be utilized in another crisis, right? So, you know, it's not difficult to imagine that um, schools of public health in a disaster zone, so in New Orleans, in the middle of Katrina, and then again in Ida, right, have to pivot and think about what, what are, how do their students engage with community-based organizations in the midst of a crisis? Um, what flexibility is there? How can we ensure that they're both helping the community and advancing their learning? And is, is remote um, learning part of that? Could it continue to be a, a, a permanent component? Um, and I think the, the one piece of this that, that's important to, um, going forward is we are we have regulation right now in New York State, for example, they've given us the flexibility to continue to learn in a distance education format, but that flexibility expires at the end of 2022, the academic year in 2022. Um, same thing with CEF, our accrediting agency, you know, so we have to, I think, look at what we've learned, what are the criteria um, for um, meaningful remote experiences that might allow us to be able to pivot in different kinds of crises and how do we advocate for that um, continued flexibility in a way that doesn't diminish the training of our students or any way take away from from um, their experience um, as public health learners. Um, and I, you know, I've spoken to many students um, who had to do their field experience. I, you know, as, as one example, my, my TA in my class was supposed to be embedded in a global organization in Chile and was devastated by the fact that he wouldn't be able to carry that out. And when I spoke to him several months later, he was really um, energized by the experience that he had. They were able to really work on a data surveillance project where he was sharing data with them at a long distance. They were incredibly short staffed as their trajectory in the pandemic pandemic changed, and he was able to really step in and help advance some of their important work in a way that um, turned out to be a very important training experience for him, as well as an important product for the, the organization that he went to. So we could argue that, you know, obviously missed out on some of the um, experiences he ha would have had in a face-to-face -face global setting, um, but nonetheless, there, there was important work that was done. So 
small anecdote to also share that I know um, while there was many, much disappointment, there were also many successes. So I'll stop there. All right, well, Julie, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, thinking back to the first speaker, really national organization having to do decision-making that led to some guidelines, your decision-making really led to execution on the ground uh, and, and how to move things into action. So thank you for sharing today. Um, our final presenter that I would like to introduce is Keisha Kelly, Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer with Legacy Health. Keisha? Well, good morning, everyone. I think it's afternoon where you are, but I am on the West Coast and it's in the morning. Um, I wanna preemptively apologize. I do not have any slides for you today, but I do have some rich information um, to that I think can really inform this topic. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that we're amongst this pandemic and um, I currently work for Legacy Health, um, which is a, um, it's a six licensed hospital, but it's basically a small not-for-profit healthcare organization in the Pacific Northwest. We have about 14,000 employees and um, about just shy of 5,000 of those uh, are actually nurses. And um, there's been a lot of activity up here with the vaccine mandate. And um, today is leading up to um, our deadline on our, on our mandate for our employees. So we've had a lot of things going on, but I do wanna just kind of provide some global context of why I'm here today and I've gotten a chance to, to listen in, at least on the previous um, presentation. Um, and this is really talking about how we leverage, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we leverage nursing students. Um, I joined Legacy in July, so I am gonna wave the new card, but I've been a nurse for almost 30 years and um, have always believed that um, with nursing students, you know, they are the, it, it, they're our future. And when I see them, I'm excited because these are the people that are gonna take care of me when I need care in the hospital one day. So definitely value that. But when I joined Legacy, um, we were already at a point and we did have nursing students in our facilities. And in July, you know, we were, the curve was still pretty flat, but it was starting to creep up. But we were already still recovering from a staffing crisis of having over 1500 requisitions or positions to hire that were open. And we were having some staffing challenges. And part of our workforce planning strategy was that we, were, we had a nurse residency program. And so in August, we had about 72 nurse residents that were coming into the organization. Um, and these are nurses that are um, practically right out of nursing school. So, um, and, you know, and to give context, given the pandemic, a lot of their experience had been virtual. Um, so we learned very quickly as our uh, curve started to go up with the pandemic that um, this was a different landscape of, of, of new nurses that we've had than in the past. And we know that a lot of that had to do with how their final days of training in nursing school were. Um, and so as our um, surge started to go up and having these 72 residents across our facilities, we were also having to look at alternate models of care to be able to provide safe care for our patients. If you've heard anything about Oregon, things have gotten pretty bad here to a point where we had to deploy the National Guard to really help us um, to provide care for our patients. So a couple, um, I believe it was around August, September timeframe, we had to make a difficult decision that we had these 72 brand new nurses that we needed to make sure that they were successful so that they can care for our patients. Um, but we also had our nurses that were working in a space where they had, um, they were, where they would normally have had four patients, they were taking care of five to six and caring for and taking care of uh, and precepting our residents. And then we had the nursing students there as well too. And so we were worried about the burnout of our nurses and, and their resilience. And we had to make a difficult decision to put a pause on the clinical rotations in our organization so that our nurses could focus on making sure that these residents who, were going, who are our employees could be successful. But now that we're, we're kind of peaking in our, um, in our numbers, but we are faced with some challenges around the vaccine mandate and, and gonna have some constraints in our staffing then. My nurse executive team, I have a team of eight chief nurses, 
we have developed a way where we are going to bring back our nursing students back into the organization. What we've learned with our residents is that they actually, there were just some core competencies that you get in nursing school that they didn't have the benefit of doing. And it was everything from simple to doing vital signs and, you know, ambulating a patient, turning a patient, you know, you would think that those would be things that we can just do in our sleep. But they had missed out on that opportunity. So the learning curve for our current residents was very steep. So we've actually, we have a number of academic partnerships here in the Pacific Northwest. And so we've come up with a proposal and we're calling it, um, and I have the name here of it, but it's basically a basic fundamentals um, course. And we are allowing nursing students to come back in our hospitals. Um, and, uh, and, and it's basically um, going to be focused, targeted training on just those basic fundamentals of nursing. It's not the care planning and, you know, the medication administration. It really is kind of the core basic skills of, um, of caring for, pa of, of taking care of patients. But the additional benefit to that for us is that we are in these extended care models. I mean, in my, and we're doing what we call crisis documentation, where we've actually had to scale back our documentation because of the increased burden that we've put on our nurses in terms of their patient load. Even in critical care, we currently have one-to-one -one patients that are now in two, pa two patients to one nurse, but we have provided extenders of um, helping hands for them to be able to care for them. So we really felt that we have a place for our nursing students to, to, um, to really help us and be an integral part of it. And I think it also helps them with learning things like how do you put on PPE because you know that was hard enough for us who were very experienced. Um, and so we have that pilot and so far five of our academic partners have elected to allow us to, um, to, to bring these nurses back into the organization. And we have, um, a, we have a level one trauma center and we have a, one of the largest pediatric hospitals in the state of Oregon. And those are gonna be two of the targeted sites that our nursing students come back to, but we're also um, still trying to learn which other facilities. Um, so that's gonna start on October the 18th and we're gonna run that pilot through the end of the year. Um, but it, it's a win-win. It gives the nursing students an opportunity to be in the clinical setting but it allows us to also leverage them to help us to deliver safe care to our patients. So that is um, where we are right now. This is a very difficult time for all of us in healthcare. And so um, that's kind of the extent of what we're doing here in, in Oregon. Um, so I will just pause there. That's kind of all I wanted to share today. And um, I hope that meets the objectives. I apologize. Um, I'm knee deep in operations right now, but I certainly wanted to make a contribution to this conversation. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Keisha. Um, and thank you also to Julie and Allison. Um, we appreciate your thoughts, insights, um, hearing about how um, learners and students were handled at your um, respective sites. And um, definitely appreciate you joining us during this ongoing time of crises for many of us. So now we're going to um, break out into several breakout rooms um, so that we can have some small discussion about um, questions or comments that you might have for our three presenters. And then um, following those breakout sessions, we'll join back together, ask those questions and get some um, reactions from our three presenters. So look out, you will be moving to a breakout room now. Thank you.